Thank you. Thank you. You've already seen two great finalists before me. My name is Howard A. Rosenblum. And uh, the reason I have to say the A is because there's a lot of Howard Rosenblums out there, and I'm Howard A. The reason I'm applying for, I am applying for the NAD CEO position. I am from Chicago, Illinois. I'm an attorney. I've been an attorney for the last 18 years, working for the rights of deaf and hard of hearing people. I currently work for an agency in Chicago called Equipped for Equality. And we look for rights for individuals who are disabled regarding discrimination and education. That's my basic experience, and I've been doing that for a number of years. Plus, I am the founder of the Midwest Center for Law and the Deaf, and um, we've been working on that around advocacy for deaf people to make sure they have access to attorneys, because many attorneys won't provide for communication access. So this particular organization works with attorneys and court systems to make sure that there are, is access to make sure there is funding, to make sure that we have funding for this organization, and many other organizations across the Midwest can then set up their own 501c3. I've worked with many organizations in establishing their nonprofit status, and so I have an organization from that. That brings me to my application for this position. During the interview process, they asked me about what, what, how do I envision, cherish our past, and invest in our future? And our mission is to preserve, promote, and protect civil, human, and linguistic rights for deaf and hard of hearing people across the country. I want to make sure that mission stays strong. That's the core of why, how we can become equivalent and become, that's what I've been working on the last 18 years. But we have to learn from the past. We have to find and recognize our mistakes, plan for our future, and create our vision. And that leads to the second question. Is that we should never forget the 1880 Milan Conference and what that has done to our educational process. Imagine without that where we would be today. Because of that conference, we have continued to struggle around educational issues. But we can get beyond that. But we have to stop chasing the demons. They're still there. We will never forget the Milan Conference. But we need to think about the future, focus on the future, and how we can succeed now. That should be our vision. My vision for 2020 is the six E's. We primarily need equality. It's unacceptable to have anything less than equality in the year 2020. It's as simple as that. And how we get there is through enforcement. To make sure places are following the law and going beyond what the law mandates them to provide. In terms of education, our children should not have to suffer anymore. Our children should get all of the equal, educa equal education that they deserve. And throughout education for college and years beyond college. And then there's employment. We deserve the same opportunities to find work. Not just the menial jobs. We want equal opportunities for any j jobs, whether they're, wherever they're from, government jobs, corporate jobs, nonprofit jobs, we need to break through that glass ceiling, and we can. We need to continue to push for equal opportunities in employment. We can't do all work and no play, or all education and no play. We also need to have an enjoyment of life. Captions need to be provided in theaters, no question. We need to have interpreters provided. Museums, events, tours, interpreters have to be there. No more argument. It's time for the arguments to be done. We need to, um, we need to stop fighting and actually get what we've been asking for. And part of our everyday life is to going to the doctor, to the hospital, to a lawyer's office. All of those services should be accessible. We are behind because of the communication barriers that we face. 
medical services, they need to understand our rights. They need to understand them completely, and that happens through enforcement. We can't have a vision of 2020 without expansion of our membership. We need to have 100,000 members, and we can do that so that our membership can make NAD strong. The third question was, how can NAD become a household word? There's a lot of ideas to accomplish this, together with your help, with the board's help. We can make NAD a truly a household word. Advocacy, that's who I am. That's what I know. Doctors, lawyers, hospitals, we need them to be afraid of us, to say, oh, we better comply with the law or else NAD is going to come after us. We need to do some research. We need to pr promote awareness. We need to work together as a team across the country to make changes. For research and awareness, we need more of that. We need partnerships with different universities, Gallaudet, CSUN, NTID, all of these other universities that provide and do research on different issues. We need to look into babies. Deaf babies aren't getting the language. Hearing babies are taught language. That's not all right. We need to expand that concept because you notice many senior citizens, if you look at them, Deaf senior citizens, have you noticed? They are going strong. They can still live and communicate, but my hearing members in my family who are seniors, they live a much different life. They don't have any energy. I see a lot of deaf senior citizens very energetic, and I think there's ASL health benefits. ASL provides health benefits. We need research on that. We need to get the word out that this is how NAD can become a household name. It's not, there's, these are just a couple of ideas. We can go on for hours. Also, we need to create rankings for our needs. U.S. News, Yearly, people look at them to find out which colleges they rank as the top. Money Magazine reports on the best cities. People always look about what city they live in, where it comes in in the ranking. Fortune Magazine talks about the best companies to work for. Black Enterprises talks about diversity. Where's the ranking for the deaf community? Where are companies that hire deaf people? Where are companies that are most deaf friendly? Or about theaters that provide captioned movies? Where are those kind of rankings? We don't have that. I have some more ideas. Political context. This is vitally important. We can't just sit back and become an armchair advocate. We've got to go to DC the White House, the Congress. NAD, every one of you have a membership card. That's not enough. We need a membership card saying who are your state and con congressional delegates. That needs to be on your membership card. We need a database in headquarters, meaning that we contact the senator and then we can say how many people are from his or her district that we will garner support for or against a particular piece of legislation. That way our contact becomes not only more personal, more powerful. That way we can show that we are a powerful lobby. And of course, the social media, as we've talked about, getting the word out, vlogs, blogs, Facebook, Twitter, everything. We have some of those now, but we need to make that more prevalent in our community. We need to make sure our name gets in the newspaper. I'm going to jump to the next. We need to be in the news. We need to be there. Every story that talks about a deaf person, NAD needs to be there. NAD needs to provide a quote. We need to be watching for those kind of things so that we can set up relationships with reporters so that every reporter, we have all of their phone numbers and their contact information so they know us and we know them. 
In terms of partnering with corporations, we have done that. But as you saw today, the award for CBS, the gentleman talked about CBS and about captioning for the Super Bowl and how that has, the, that has been the best ever. 80% of the promos and commercials were captioned. But now because of that, they're wanting to make all of their media uh, on their internet caption accessible. There's a lot of ideas out there. And also, these partnerships bring funding. It bring name recognition and funding. We need to be transparent. We need you to be on committees. We need you to be involved so that you can buy in to what is NAD and to be proud of NAD. We want NAD to be a model so that everybody wants to be a member and wants to be a proud member of NAD. That's a way to grow our membership. We need to do a better job in recruiting parents of deaf children to become members of our organization. Recruiting parents. They have resources. We can provide them additional information to say, we are here to help you be the best parent of your deaf child. And provide them free membership for their deaf children. So that that deaf child knows about NAD and they can become future leaders. It's about the next generation. So my vision is let's become a powerful union, regardless of your race, your orientation, where you're from. Oh, this is really slow. <laughs> where you went to school, what kind of school you went to, what kind of college you went to, what college you went to, if you're mad, if you're happy, if you're a dreamer, if you're a doubter, if you're an activist. Wow, that was really slow. <laughs> Total communication, ASL, oralism, cochlear implants, hearing aids, it doesn't matter. Deafblind individual, histina, Latino, Hispanic, doesn't matter. I'm sorry, you have to be patient with this. We're having some technical difficulties here. Adopted. Lutherans, Asians, black people, it doesn't matter. Interpreters, friends of our community, from the south, from the north, from the east, from the west, it doesn't matter. Whether you went to a community college, where you went to other kinds of things, if you have a job or you're on welfare, it doesn't matter. If you're homeless, we should help you. If you're hopeful, if you're pessimist, if you're ambitious, if you're involved in pol politics or not, if you're a Democrat or a Republican, it doesn't matter. If you have passion, if you don't care, all of these things we can create in NAD. Thank you. for as long as I've been an advocate. There's different forms that autism can take. I think part of the problem over the last 20 years in our struggle with the ADA, I believe that ADA is a civil rights law and it's very powerful, but still there's a lot of awful things that happen. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 regarding intolerance and you think about the last 45 years, that group of individuals still combat racial discrimination. It's gotten less, but I think it's gonna take time for us as well. But I think we can do a better job. For one thing, we need a system change. 
One reason that I'm interested in taking on this job at NAD is because I think I can do something for the 50 states to make a change. You know, many of you have problems with hospitals. Hospitals won't provide interpreters. You struggle to get communication access. The greatest solution to that kind of autism is an organization that looks at all hospitals, and they're much more powerful than the Department of Justice. And it's called the Joint Commission, the Joint Commission, and they certify hospitals across the country. They monitor them, they audit them to make sure they have the right number of nurses, they have the right number of doctors, whether or not their equipment is up to date and the state of the art, and if they provide communication access, and do they have phone numbers available and ready, and do they have all of those things that they need, and how many deaf patients are, uh, come into that particular hospital. Why can't we get that added to them? That would certainly be one way to combat autism, and there are many, many more. We have to look at each area and look at the big picture and look at system change rather than one little lawsuit at a time is not going to make the change we want. I'm tired of those little lawsuits. I think you're probably tired of those little lawsuits. It's time for system change. Wow. <laughs> okay, yes, we have a few more, and I'm trying to link common questions together into one basic okay. question. This is all related to finance. You spoke very well about the NAD becoming a recognized organization and a household word. But what about inside the NAD? And how will you manage the finances within in the NAD? And as an attorney, what qualifies you to do this job as CEO in a supervisory role? Let me try to answer the second part that would then relate to the first part of her question. In terms of my experience, I am a founder, uh, 13 years ago, I set up an organization called the Midwest Center on Law and the Deaf. We set that up from scratch, wrote the bylaws, created the board, did the 501c3 paper, we got all of the federal approval that we needed, and then started looking for grants to actually run that organization, hired staff, and it's been going strong for the last 10 years. During good times and during bad times. I remember in the, we got three grants right away, and I thought, oh, this is gonna be so easy, what is everybody complaining about? And then the next five grants requests, I didn't get any of them back. Oh, so then I realized how serious this kind of process was. So just sometimes you get grants and sometimes you don't get grants, so it's a really unpredictable funding stream. Looking at corporate corporations, law firms, events, doing all kinds of creative fundraising, and we've been able to get by over the last number of years through a 501c3, and I advise a lot of 501c3 or organizations through my law practice because of my own experience in managing a 501c3. Now, in terms of internal finances, I know that that's a challenge for NAD and will probably be. Donations are down, interest rates are on the way down, so we need to diversify our investments. We need to increase our membership, parents, deaf people from all over the country. That alone won't help, but we need to increase the number of grants we get. We need to plant the seeds for future contacts. So if they don't have money now, perhaps when they do get money, they'll remember us. We need to develop those relationships, do it now that will pay off for us in later. Federal government, state government, we need to network with those people who give out money and appropriations. So I have a lot of experience with networking with the White House over the last several years and the Obama administration. And I understand that we need to go in there on an 
nonpartisan basis, but develop relationships and looking for funding from the federal government and developing relationships, not only for the media partnerships, but other types of partnerships and money that could be available. And of course, my favorite thing to do is to sue. I like to sue. I like to get money. I like to win suits. I'm always looking for other ideas. If you have ideas, share them. It's, I'm going to be an out of the box kind of thinker. That's how you survive in life these days. So there's a lot of things I think we can do. The finance committee is a great committee that we have to get some consultation. I will ask for the board's work also as we continue to grow our financial base. And I forgot what the third part of your question was. Your supervisory managerial experience. Right. Uh, my nonprofit organization, uh, and I've also advised other 501c3s. I've I had to fire people. I'm an attorney. I've had to tell people, I'm sorry, uh, they need to get their belongings and leave the office. Other things have come out. I've um, been uh, on the board. I've advised staff. So I have that experience in dealing with staff issues as well, and particularly around 501c3, internal legal issues, those kind of things, and I advised organizations on those issues. Do you feel that the NAD should respond to the NCO, I'm going to let you read this, to the NCO coalition? The NEO coalition is something that, it's like the KKK. You think about um, in vitro fertilization and thinking about they're telling us what we can or cannot do. And I think Nancy Block, uh, for her credit, to think about a committee under the Public Policy Commission that we have been working on the last four years. And one of those subcommittees is a bioethics group looking at what we can do because we need to know what they're doing. We need to know what's happening in the UK. We need to think about what's happening in how this relates to unconstitutional activity against U.S. citizens. We cannot go back to the Nazi Germany. We simply cannot go there. The NEO oralism, we have to think about how we can beat them at their own game. We have to continually to look at research that says deaf babies can learn language. We have to look at senior citizens, like I talked about, how ASL is healthy for them, and how ASL benefits everyone, regardless of their hearing status. ASL is healthy. That's how we win. A deaf, a deaf young person? Great, the leaders of the future. How do you preserve and protect, protect and promote the health of the NAD as far as the youth the junior NAD? Good question. One idea, as we talking about, I talked about recruiting parents, we also need to be a strong, powerful media message so that all parents understand that sign language and deaf adults are successful. Deaf people are lawyers, teachers, writers, professors, carpenters, every walk of life. Every, ed every educational level, every gender, background, color, orientation, race, it doesn't matter. We need to make sure the media gets our complete message so that parents can understand that my child will be fine. That's one way to use the media to our advantage. And also the youth. The youth can relate with parents as adults, and we need to get them in here to also help spread the message. I think that would be a strong and powerful way to use the media to our advantage, to work with parents and so that they can then understand their children. All related. How do you envision partnering with oral groups while still making sure that AS ASL is not, is not compromised in the process? And another one that is somewhat related is how you can strengthen oral deaf people and, and signing deaf people and, and link those together. Well, first it's easier to answer the second question again. For 
we should not punish oral deaf people. We should welcome them into our organization. They are a part of our family. We should create partnerships with them, welcome them into our world because they are a part of our culture. That's really the key. Just welcome them. We are family. But at the same time, I do not support oral education. I value bilingual education. But we have to remember that what is our philosophy? We need issues that we can agree on, like movie theater captioning. Other things are not important, just that particular issue. Let's fight together for that issue. We may disagree on issues of education. If we have no compromise in any issue, then we can't work together. We've got to find a way to succeed. I don't care if it's politics or anything. I want equality for all now. And we will do whatever we have to do politically to get it done. If you don't like that, I'm sorry, but we will get it done. The politi political action committee, could you give some um, ideas about that and how you envision the PAC playing a role in the NAD in the political process? To be honest, I don't really, I know a lot about 501c3s, 501c4, 501c7, but uh, PAC, they're a different animal. I would have to do my homework on them and look at other models across the country. The NAACP, they have a model. The APD is a model if they have a PAC. Uh, look at how that works, look at how it's structured and then copy that model. If it doesn't work, find out what we can do to improve on their model. So at this point, I don't fully understand how PACs operate and how they're set up and how that would make it more feasible for us to lobby in Congress compared to what we can do now under a 50C3 status. So I know that there are certain restrictions that we have as a 501C3 in terms of our lobbying efforts, but then the PAC can do other things. But first, we have to make sure that we have stable funding for NAD because we wouldn't want the PAC to take away from our potential funding streams, but they could be fierce lobbyists on our behalf. Okay, oh. last question. One more question. You know, deaf residential schools are dwindling in numbers. How can you ensure that deaf and hard of hearing students have full access to the classrooms? And my background as a civil rights attorney and a special education attorney, I'm very familiar with the system under the special education law. Schools, are, schools for the deaf are part of the continuum of school options. Drafted by law, that is one of the options. I think we need to go back to the Department of Education and say, you are violating federal law because these residential schools are closing. People need access to visual education, and residential schools to provide that. And when those kids go to those kind of educational environments, we know that they're more successful. The law says you have to provide that as an option. You're not doing that. Therefore, you're in violation of the law. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'll go back over there. <laughs>